Thank you, Mr. Dean. Appreciate the kind invitation, and it's really a pleasure to be here uh, speaking to you on a topic that's quite dear to me as well. It's so great to see so familiar faces in kind of a role that I've had before. But uh, anyway, we'll, uh, we'll, uh, water management is, is a topic that I've had as an interest of mine for a fairly long time. Hydrologic cycle, uh, amazing. We've had it in our minds since, what, grade nine or something like that. And the fascinating thing about this is that now, and especially if you win Kent's 40-inch television and you have internet connection, you can bring up probably a 100 different pictures of the hydrologic cycle. The fascinating thing is none of them are the same. And in fact, my professional view is that most of them are incomplete. As a rule, that's a fascinating teaching tool because then I ask, what's missing? So it seems like a small point, but it really isn't because how we view the hydrologic cycle and where we put ourselves is so critical in terms of our view of management. <clears throat> And just some hydrologic notes, the hydrologic cycle cannot be modified. It's what makes the water go around. But we need to remember that the magnitude of its components can, and we do it all of the time. And in fact, it's fascinating standing here and watching the snow come down, so all about. Okay, the hydrologic equation. Sorry, I didn't mean to cheer you up quite that well. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, this is an equation that's been around a very, very long time. Everybody uses it. We look at the different components, and just fundamentally a basis from inputs minus outputs is equal to the change in storage. It just doesn't come any simpler than that. Now, the fascinating thing about it is that we take that equation for granted. It goes on without us. It goes on with us, and we, don't, we often don't really appreciate how much we have an influence in terms of water management. Now, one of the things to remember is that not all water users are the same. And in Kim's previous slide, there was one off to the right side where she talked about consumptive use of water. And it's a huge difference whether you're a consumptive user or a non-consumptive user because it's, as Kim said, it's are you downstream, are you able to get water to those individuals. I was quite fascinated by this slide when, when I saw it. If you read my abstract, you'll, you'll realize that my talk revolves around a glass of water and how we view it. And this one I found is quite interesting because on the right, it's the glass that says what we already have. And so it's basically how can we make better use of that water that we have. But it's the one on the left that I act, and, and the one on the right is one that we, 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 we use so much in terms of conservation efforts, et cetera, and that makes a lot of sense. But it's the one on the left that I find really interesting. It's what we need. So it's presupposing that we need a full glass of water. So sorry, but half a glass just ain't going to cut it. We need to get more water. Well, everybody knows, and Kim reiterated, it's a finite source. Now, the fascinating thing, though, is that belief locks us into a certain strategy of uh, what I'd call water management that I actually think is quite restrictive. And I do believe there are ways in which we can get more water. And if you're interested, this is a very self-serving plug. I have a breakout session, and for no fee to you, well, actually, I guess the conference fee, you can learn all about it. Okay, my fearless predictions for 2050. And anybody who makes predictions know if you're really smart, you never say anything that somebody can test in your lifetime. <laughs> and as, as John referred to, I am an old guy, and as I made this slide, I thought, like, whoa, I have some genes to take people into 
few more decades beyond me and I go like, whoa, there's an outside chance I might be here, but I don't think so. But anyway, so most of you will, you can remember. And it, it is, I use the word fearless because I put them out there. I believe the purpose is to challenge people and for us to think about issues and how we're going to approach them. I have two guiding principles and these we must not take lightly. Those are ones that I think we should adopt, but they're also ones that have huge implications of how we view water. The first one is that water is a human right. So clean water and sanitation for everyone, no exceptions. I know what that is, but there has been discussion at the UN, et cetera, et cetera. The second guiding principle is Water for Life Goal 2. And as a professional, I can tell you that as Albertans, we should really be proud of the Water for Life strategy. It is a darn good document. And the second goal is healthy aquatic ecosystems and in-stream flow needs. Some of the earlier speakers talked about the importance of nature and water to health. We are really going to start to see that over the next little while and we're going to see people who want to talk more about it. Growing population on Earth, we've already heard nine point, it's interesting, 907, 920 something, 2050, how will we feed them? So we reached seven billion on October 1st, October 31st of 2011. I'm not entirely sure you can see the graphs as whether it's dark enough, but these are the projections for population and if you note, right about in here is when 2050 occurs. And you don't really need the years, but the thing you need to note is two of the graphs bend over. So the population of the Earth will not continue to climb as per this, the, the, the red one. Now, those of you from a range background know all about carrying capacity, et cetera, et cetera. And what if we said the Gaia hypothesis said that the Earth was a huge rangeland? We know that there are consequences. It has a certain carrying capacity, and then other things happen. But the fascinating thing is the world's population, according to two projections, will peak and perhaps even come down at 9 billion. I like this. this idea of the scales and it's basically water supply on the right, human uh, demand for water on the left and it's been tilted already. And when I first saw the diagram the first thing that came to my mind was Peggy Lee's song about is that all there is. Uh, for those of you that are born post 1988 or something you might want to google it just to know what I'm really talking about. <clears throat> Okay, hydrologic considerations in the predictions. I'm finding that the emphasis is almost solely on demand so that people have really been working on conservation efforts and Kim, some of the efforts in terms of Europe, etc. Very major, major contribution. My philosophy in this talk is that water quality is not an issue if you have no water so that fundamentally I'm concentrating just on the quantity side. I recognize there are huge quality issues, huge implications. And I guess I look at it and say, why is there no attention to supply? Yes, I know that the hydrologic cycle says that there's a finite amount of water, but the thing is, it is so easy to manipulate the components of the hydrologic cycle and the hydrologic equation. As a matter of fact, we do it every day, every one of us, we just don't realize it. Okay, caveat. So let's remember that if we manipulate one component of the hydrologic equation, at least one of the others will be affected. Duh. Okay, management note. Population growth will be non-uniform geographically in many areas in the world. Already water stress will be even more so. Kim's graph was very clear in showing that the third world countries are the ones that are water stressed. That's where the population is going to be uh, stressed even more. Other areas will, will uh, see relatively low population growth and relatively little water stress from that stressor. Regional approach to water management within a watershed context. One of the scary parts about being a speaker 
later in a sequence is that some speaker ahead of you is going to say something totally contradictory to what you believe and then you're kind of stuck, what do I do? Anyway, I'm really fortunate because the speakers ahead of me have essentially and Kim and I are right on same bit about the regional approach. Now, this isn't a simple statement. We also need to remember that as much as professionals and everything, we want to do altruistic things and help people. The reality of the situation is if we use less water in Banff, Alberta, Canada, we don't help the people in Phoenix, Arizona create any more golf courses to use water. That's just the reality of the situation and I can tell you're touched beyond belief. So. <clears throat> Okay, so water management strategies often need to be region specific and they are rarely truly transferable. And that's the part you have to be really careful. For example, if you're in the area of beneficial management practices, you've got to be so careful because you can read the literature from Eastern United States and say you should try it. Well, you could read something from the Maritimes. For example, Charlottetown gets almost 1,200 millimeters of precipitation. We get 450, okay? Uh, a slight difference. Okay, increased attention to capturing runoff. That's where I believe that our major attention will come from. Climate change, climatological extremes have always occurred and they will continue. Uh, several speakers talked about the variability, the variability increasing, the extremes increasing, etc. <clears throat> Huge unknown, and this is something that actually uh, Bob was talking about, I believe, is what will happen to region, regions' patterns in precipitation amounts and distributions. And I firmly believe, and, and I thought Bob's talk was right on about, for us, we need to take note of snow. I was raised in East Central Alberta, and over the last almost 30 years, I've seen dramatic changes in the, in the amount of overwinter snow. And in fact, uh, it's not only changed the from less snow, but actually more rain as well. <clears throat> uh, showed some, in, there were some previous pictures about floods. It's the, the uh, irony of the situation. It's the flood that actually creates the great opportunity for us to gain water, but we actually have to be ready as well. Okay, strategic irrigation in a warmer world with many more mouths to feed. So we're still gonna have two more billion people born by the time you can check my predictions. And we need more food. A lot of that will come from irrigation. There's been a lot of criticism of irrigation for being water waster, et cetera, et cetera. Some of the criticisms are perfectly valid. But we also need to address the whole bit that uh, we can use irrigation to increase food production and in fact if there is any hope for feeding 9 billion my belief is that's where it's going to have to come from. Now strate strategic is such a wonderful word because you can interpret it in whatever way you wish but it essentially means we will use the water in a manner in which we determine to be in the best interest of all the people and we'll come back to that, that comment. <clears throat> Likely loss of small wetlands in a warmer world. We've talked, we've already heard about the importance from Bill about wetlands and their, their processing power, very, very true. Increased evaporation, and unless we can come up with some way of enhancing runoff, we will simply lose these wetlands. And in fact, I think in many areas we already have uh, periodic droughts. Here's an interesting idea, importance of land to water generation. I actually believe that there will be water farms so that we'll actually have areas where we actually designate their sole role is to generate water. Isn't that an interesting idea of, of having that as the product? So, and I actually believe we'll pay people for their water generating capabilities. And that's really an interesting idea that we actually set aside land, we work with people. Some of us will own and manage land solely for its gen water generation capabilities. And that's where knowing a little bit of hydrology really comes in because you can go to your real estate agent and then buy the best land for water. And I'm not entirely sure this is legal right now because you don't really own water, but 
the whole notion if you can sell power to the grid, why can't you sell water to the grid? That's what we're going to be needing. Okay, urban areas used for water collection. This is one area that does bewilder me, and that is that if you are looking for ways in which you want to get more water from an area, the easiest thing to do is to pave it. And that sounds like an urban area to me. We take agricultural land, we create a, an urban subdivision, we render 40 to 60 percent of the area impermeable, and then we wonder what, pray tell, are we going to do with all the water? So what we do is we have municipalities that insist that you have downspouts that go alongside of your house so you can saturate your soil and then you can store the water in your basement. What an amazing concept. You know, we have this water supply and it's basically we're not making use of it. We will. There are all kind of water quality problems, I know that. The fascinating thing is just, oh, the internet's wonderful. I was just reading that there's something like 120,000 homes in Toronto that are now being forced to disconnect their downspouts from the, the storm system because the system isn't able to handle it. Good reasons, very, very good reasons, but wow, if the Great Lakes need water, why aren't we using it? Okay, entire suite of strategic reservoirs. Yeah, yeah, I know I left the word dam out. Uh, because there will be all kind of reservoirs. The reality of the situation is if a flood s goes by and you're sitting on the river and it going by and the drought comes, you're likely not going to have water. So the reality is we are going to have reservoirs. Uh, uh, groundwater recharge, infiltration farms, same, same idea. Instead of so storing water on the land, why don't we really work collectively to recharge aquifers? Local incentives and moving people, concentrating people. Whoa, this one's so straightforward. Human beings have this really weird habit of living where water isn't. Okay, the projections for the increase in population in southwestern United States is staggering. Climate and golf, okay? No water, but we'll talk about that later kind of thing. So luckily the downturn in the economy uh, cause that to slow down. But here's the other part about it. Ecologically concentrating any critter in one spot is just not a good idea. But the reality is with people it is if you're talking about water management because we have a much better chance of providing safe, clean drinking water and being able to dispose of the wastes in an environmentally friendly way as much as possible if we concentrate people. Some of the areas in the world could be rendered uninhabitable. That will happen. Fresh water could become an illusion, but maybe we just think we have fresh water right now because if you really can't go into the Rocky Mountains without drinking water from the stream, unlike all those cowboy movies where they walk into the stream with their horses, then maybe we don't have as much fresh water as we think. Water treatment plants, positively, we, need, we will have those and more of them. That's just the reality of the situation, especially if we're going to start dealing with uh, water quality as the major issue. And, and I come back to Bill's talk is that don't automatically think that this is bricks and mortars because water treatment plants could be wetlands and they can be done used very effectively. Pipelines for water, heightened use of gray water. You know, using the water for various purposes. Uh, for those of us that were raised in rural areas and were faced with water shortages, we've been there, done that. Desalinization, well, we don't exactly have an ocean right next to us, but there are parts of the world that do. Capturing icebergs as they float down the Bow River. Uh, I threw that one in just to see if you're paying attention. So, <laughs> you know, that one I'm reasonably sure we won't be seeing. Okay, fearless prediction, other considerations. Better linkage of natural sciences, social sciences, engineering, and politics in decision making. All four together. Holistic consideration of water as a resource, considering carbon economy, energy, food, and water. And Kim touched on it in her presentation, and she had three of those components, uh, added a few others. And 
what if we reframe the irrigation issue in the context of, for example, for for X cubic meters of water, how much food do we get and how much carbon do we sequester? But also how much energy do we use to get it, et cetera, et cetera. We suddenly begin to look at water in a very, very different context. And my belief is in very short order, we'll never talk about water alone as a resource. We'll talk about these other things as well. Other views, other views, not mine. Stresses related to decreased Water availability are likely to continue to raise the demand for water resource management based on science and professional expertise. And this was the editor of the Journal of Soil Water Conservation in 2008, kind of an editorial piece. My personal belief, Mark, that we long passed that, okay? The issues that we're facing now or we're gonna face in 2050 or 2100, the water management skills that we have are the same ones. They're not going to change. We learned a hydrologic cycle. We learned a hydrologic equation. Guess what? It's how we're going to apply it that's going to make all the difference. And when will land use and human activity be managed to provide the water needed? Whoa. No, that's an interesting one. So we're actually talking about managing land use. Well, yeah, that could be water farms, etc. But that's not really the one I was interested in. It's the human activity. So if you manage human activity, one of the things you need to be prepared for is you need to tell somebody you ain't going to do that on that piece of land. And that part, I'm not entirely sure we're ready for, but we will get there. Here's another one that's really interesting. Water scarcity is a headline favorite of the doom mongers in company with peak oil, overpopulation, climate chaos, and war. It might be more constructive to regurgitate these existential fears into political resolve to protect the water cycle on which we all depend. It's kind of a cool statement. And it's the bit about the political resolve is what are we able to do? What are we willing to do, et cetera? Uh, I'm sorry, but the hydrologist has to come out in me, and that is that the water cycle doesn't really need to be protected. It's quite capable of looking after itself. We mess it up quality-wise and everything else, but as Kim said, you can't destroy or create water. If governments can observe principles of freshwater sustainability and equitable distribution, and here are the key words, then there is more than sufficient knowledge, technology, and water itself to meet our needs. Now that's interesting. So that uh, governments can observe principles of sustainability and equitable. Remember, we are the government, so let's work together. If you remember one of the slides that Kim had, there was that key word collaborative. And if any of you had the chance to be in the session with Dr. Ernie Thiessen yesterday afternoon, you'll realize, or at least there is a body of knowledge that believes we actually can do better if we work collaboratively. And I have a challenge for the oil sands group. So right at the moment, I can think of at least four distinct groups that have an interest in monitoring. Can you imagine what would happen if the four of them got together, sat in the same room, and said, we have to stop wasting money, each of us monitoring in our own way, if we pool our money, let's talk about what we're trying to find. They each are very sincere and they are very, very focused and disparate. Okay, foreign aid for water. I mean, that's certainly a possibility if we can be concerned about food for people internationally, why not water? About a week ago, I got uh, the hard copy proceedings from this conference. It's the 2011 Water for Food Conference in Lincoln, Nebraska. For those of you who know, there's a land institute there. But it was the title that caught my attention. It said, Paths to Solutions. So what if we adopted that as our philosophy, that that's what we're going to do? We're going to work together to deal with our issues, and we will move forward together. And as I said in my abstract, the glass is half full. Thank you.